good morning and good evening thank you all for joining us awaken talks uh, is a space where we share stories that help plant seeds for a more compassionate society while fostering our own inner transformation we do this by holding collective conversations with guest speakers from all walks of life who inspire us to live in a more service oriented way and behind each of these calls is an entire team of service based volunteers who help uh, enable this offering and to allow us to hold this space today our guest speaker is shaheen mistri and thank you all for joining today's call i request that we start our call with a minute of silence to anchor ourselves into this space thank you and welcome now i will invite our volunteer bhumika to share an opening prayer sangachatvam sambadatvam sambhuvanansi janata यथापूर्वे संजना समानीव आकूति समाना हृदयानी वह समानीव आकूति समाना हृदयानी वह समान मस्तु वो मनो यथाव सुसहासते संगछत्व संवद thank you bhumika for that beautiful offering and what a perfect way to open our conversation today with our special guest shaheen on awaken talks who and and before i hand it over to nisha and krishnan who will be our moderators for the day i would just like to walk you through the call flow so over the next uh, 50 minutes or so krishnan will engage in a conversation with shaheen and after that uh, i request uh, uh, and after that we'll have plenty of space to engage with uh, uh, 
questions and comments and reflections from all of you. Uh, so I would request that at any time in the talk, you can send in your questions or comments, uh, either via the live, the comment box on the live stream page on which you are watching this conversation, or by emailing if that's easier for you to ask, which is ask, ask at servicespace.org. So at any time in the conversation, you're welcome to do that. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll sort of try our best to have your voice in the mix in this uh, inquiry as well. And uh, just a friendly reminder that we are operating in this usual framework and constraints of technology. So things do end up sometimes going a bit wrong, but we'll try our best to come back and resume uh, things as soon as possible. So thanks a lot in advance for uh, appreciating and, and adjusting to that. With that, I would like to pass it over to Nisha. Thank you, Nisha. Thank you so much, Rohit, and thank you so much, Bhumika. Um, let us evolve together by working together and sharing together is very much the theme of uh, today's talk, Awakening Talks in general, and the spirit of the speaker as well. Um, so um, today's talk is titled, A School for Life. And the broad themes we'll be exploring today, among other things, are um, do we work towards our inner calling or does it happen to us? And is it possible to synchronize our head, heart, and hands in this mission? And what does true education look like in a post-pandemic world? To explore these um, with Shaheen Nistri in conversation today will be Krishnan Ranganathan. Um, it's a it's difficult to introduce someone as multifaceted as Krishnan, but I will try. Krishnan is a volunteer at heart. And uh, his school teachers who wrote on his report card that he's too talkative may find it very hard to believe that he grew up to be a very introspective adult who walks the talk very mindfully. And um, Krishnan is currently working with Udyam.org Udyam is a platform that has touched hundreds of thousands of lives um, of children, of youth, of tiny micro entrepreneurs. And uh, at work, Krishnan is adored for his knack of holding the mission with intensity on the left hand and compassion for the team on the right hand and balancing it both. And at home, he's adored by his wife Deepa for the quality time he makes for their twin daughters as well as his parents. And um, Krishnan's family has been living in Bengaluru for more than 100 years. And with that short introduction, I hand over to Krishnan. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Uh, I don't think I've ever been introduced in uh, such a fabulous way before. So thank you for that. Uh, if there is any bit of nervousness in my voice, it is because of just being announced as being talkative in class in front of Shaheen. Uh, all right. Uh, it is indeed my pleasure today to be introducing Shaheen Mistry, uh, an educator at heart, uh, a mother of two girls, a hobby painter, and an animal lover, amongst many other things. Uh, Shaheen, like uh, many of us know, is the founder of Akanksha Foundation at Mumbai and the nationally popular Teach for India which has impacted over a million children and has also virtually been the breeding ground for social entrepreneurship and educational initiatives alike. She's an Ashoka Fellow, a global leader for tomorrow at the World Economic Forum, an Asia Society 21 leader, and more recently, a Jamnalal Bajaj awardee for promoting Gandhian values. What is most striking to me about Shaheen is that uh, in a seemingly impossible task of educating 320 million Indian children, uh, she sees that as a magical opportunity uh, of engaging with 320 million partners uh, to create the greatest show on earth. Uh, and in this long and audacious movement, uh, Shaheen wisely remarks that the biggest challenge uh, is to find the strength and love in my heart each and every single day. Uh, thank you very much, Shaheen, for agreeing uh, to be with us today 
and and welcome you to this conversation which i have been looking forward to over the last few days thank you krishnan thank you all right uh, so so shahin i i think i'm going to start with something uh, something in your profile that was very exciting for me to hear uh, and something that's very very uncommon uh, very very uncommon to see uh, in people uh, and i'm referring to the fact about how you lived the first 18 years of your life across 13 different countries uh, right now while that may look uh, look like a data point uh, for many uh, right and can be consumed as numbers and data there is definitely so much more to that experience uh, than just that right and so so uh, i know i'm going to take you back many years uh, in this memory but uh, tell us something about what those years were like uh, and what was shaheen uh, at the end of that period of the first uh, 18 years yeah thank you i mean firstly it's so 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 beautiful to to be here i think anything that service space does and i'm sure this will come up multiple times in our conversation is done with so much care and so much heart that um i just feel already my my heart feels very full uh this morning so so thank you for having me here just a, a small correction krishna and actually lived in five countries but attended 10 different schools so um did move around a lot um i think uh you know you know my childhood um was one of just being so deeply immersed in so many different cultures so many different people i have a very outgoing mother um who would invite everybody um home and so my my memories growing up were um being in many different school environments i started out in a french school then in an english school then in an american school in an international school so many different uh school environments many different people um lots of animals along the way um my brother and i used to to pick up stray animals from from the road so i had a very very happy childhood um i felt my life was deeply blessed um in every possible way um and, and yet i think one striking thing about my first 18 years was um a very intuitive understanding that that was not the life of many people even though i i wasn't in that sense uh very aware of it i lived very much in a bubble uh growing up but something inside me kept saying no but there there are there are children um who are just like me in every way except they're not because of the lack of opportunity um and that felt very real and striking growing up that that unfairness in the world the inequality of opportunity both with children and also with animals i think i i saw it um with both growing up got it fantastic and and yeah i think we will touch upon later on the on the pet piece as well the animal lover uh, piece as well during the conversation it was good to hear about picking up pets from the streets uh, and giving them care that's fabulous uh, so so one question what uh, was there a burning uh, desire at the end of this period was there a burning need uh, to do something about this uh, because very quickly after this is when uh, you started akanksha right some yeah. period after this so how did that yeah. happen I mean I I think you know that you can usually always point back to one sort of turning moment and 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 I have that as well like I have very vividly in my mind um this instant when I was visiting Mumbai and I was in a a black and yellow taxi at a traffic light and a few children sort of ran up to the traffic light and that felt like the moment where I just wanted to do something um and i wanted to be in india but when i look back and i say was it really that moment or or was it many 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 things over the 18 years that led to that moment i think it's probably the latter um krishna and i i think again 
Um, my parents played a very pivotal role. Mom um, grew up as a speech therapist. We had children often who had multiple um, needs in and out of our home. Um, I had volunteered since the age of 12. I think that was very, very formative. So all my summers were spent volunteering either with um, animals who needed help or with children. Um, I, I worked, you know, ranging from, uh, had volunteering experiences with autistic children, with um, children uh, who were visually impaired. I think my trip back to India um, every summer were very formative as well. Um, I, I was able to see very clearly the difference between the school that I was in, the opportunity I had, and the lack of opportunity that I saw often as I, as I just moved around the streets of Mumbai. So I think many, many tiny actions and seeds um, led to that moment where I was 18 and I said, like, you know, why am I going back to the US? Um, let me just try and be in India and try and do something. Got it, got it. Yeah. So, so Shaheen, you've been, a, you've been a great proponent of uh, love, compassion, and Dhanjian values. Uh, both in life uh, and in education, right? Uh, now, there are two parts that uh, to this question. One, was there a very specific point or event from which this blossomed? Uh, or, and the second part of the question is, uh, so when you try and translate these values into action in the education system today, uh, what kind of challenges uh, do you face? Yeah, I mean, so, so to the first part, I think there, there are sort of two parts to the first part. One is that I, I think I have learned um, love and values more from the children we've served at our Kangsha and Teach for India than from anyone else. My, my greatest lessons have been from the children who I've been truly, truly privileged um, to know. I think, Krishnan, when I came back um, to India, I came with you know, well-intentioned, but with a lot of like ideas that very quickly got disproved about um, what it was like uh, to live in poverty, um, what children, you know, which children were lucky and which children were not lucky. I had a lot of misconceptions and I think slowly and steadily through everyday interactions, my children taught me what honesty was, what courage was, what love was, um, what acceptance was. Um, and those moments were just incredibly profound. Um, and they were everyday, everyday moments, you know, whether it's like a child one day looked at me and uh, after a, a, a short break and a vacation, and I, I had come back and, and she looked at me with a big smile and said, Didi, you're looking so fat. You know, and I said, like, only a child, right, can, um, can so honestly tell you what is on their mind. So it's so a small humorous moments to very profound life-changing moments from kids. I think that was one. I think the second honestly has been um, the ecosystem that, that, that we are part of um, at Service Space. Um, at that time, it wasn't even called Service Space. Um, but I think my first trip to Ahmedabad, um, I remember so clearly, I, I used to take a group of Akanksha children to Ahmedabad. Um, my connection with Manav Sadna, the human beings that I met there, had a profound impact on me. Um, and I discovered that impact more and more over time. And so I, I think, you know, the question that Misha framed the, the call with, like, does inner transformation happen to you? Or, or you know, is it something you work on? Um, for me and my experience, it, it's honestly been a little bit of both. I think I've been incredibly blessed to have had um, people around me as we're talking. One, one moment is, is coming to mind, and it was a moment where we were um, at the Sugad campus in, in Ahmedabad, and Jayesh Bhai was sitting on the lawn, um, and he was pulling something out of the ground, and I, I went over to him, and I noticed that he was pulling... Um, a, a few weeds out of the grass. And then he just stopped and he looked very uh, troubled. And I said, Jayesh, by, you know, why are you looking so troubled? And he said, you know, inside me, it's not feeling right. 
to pull the weeds out. And, and so there were many of these like little, little moments that I was able to see and observe in the people around me. And I, I think that just made me feel like that's how I wanna live my life with that level of awareness, that level of love. And I think more recently, love especially, I think there are, there are many Gandhian values, but for me, the, 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 the all-encompassing value of love just feels just so important in the world today. Um, and, and love in all aspects, starting with love and acceptance of self, um, love for the people we work with, the children we serve, the, the vision of the work that we do. It just feels like that can take us perhaps further um, and make the journey much richer than, than not having it. So that's, that's the first. The challenges to living it, I mean, you know, I, I just feel like there are challenges whichever direction you, you take and however you live. And, and so it's better to face challenges, living the values that you believe in that, that help you to, to sleep well, well at night than not. And so again, a big turning point, I was not like this at all, but a big turning point for me was um, just starting to see challenges a little bit differently over time. And it still remains a struggle, but really being able to see them as something that will come and something that will go and something that you can really sort of elevate yourself beyond um, to make sense of or to try to make sense of. Um, and so, yes, many, many challenges along the way, but not significant enough to stand in, in the way of the journey that, that I want to live. Beautiful, beautiful. And I, I think uh, one takeaway or learning for me from this part of the conversation has been that last part that you said, uh, it's better to face challenges living the values uh, that you believe in. Uh, yeah, it's powerful. Uh, so, Shaheen, when, when we talk about uh, changing ourselves uh, in order to change the world, right, uh, as we set out to change the world, we often also talk about it in conjunction with uh, what we call as ripple effects, right, that uh, some of these, uh, there is a high possibility of them creating ripple effects. Uh, now, in your experience, uh, tell us about uh, if you had the opportunity to notice some of these ripple effects firsthand uh, in your years of experience, either uh, at TFI or outside uh, or in a personal space. Uh, tell us about if you've noticed any of these. Yeah, I mean, two, two things are coming to mind. One is a moment um, many years ago when I, I didn't know Nippon as well, um, but, but you know, I, I I at that point still believed that I was in search for the one big thing that would change education and therefore change the world. And I, I remember Nippon sitting down and talking to me about the power of small things and not big things. Um, and over the years since then, I went from believing that I could change the world to believing I could change India to like believing I could change you know, the, the small organization around me to actually realizing that I can't even really change my two daughters at home. And, and really the only thing I can do is, is focus internally. So that's been a, a very, very big journey of, of really having faith in that idea, which I think I, I brushed off when, when Nippon said it all those years ago that, that it is sort of the little acts and the little words that, that add up and, and do over time sort of overwhelm um, the world. So, so that's the first um, thing that came to mind. The second actually is much more recent. So last night um, I, I, I sat sort of covered with goosebumps because um, it was the graduation ceremony of one of our students and she was graduating from um, a, a very well-known university in the US called Franklin Marshall and her graduation ceremony was online. Um, and I remember just watching and, and the reason for the goosebumps was just understanding like what a journey 
it had been for her to navigate the challenges to get to that place. Um, but equally, what a symbol of hope in these times that with opportunity, like children can just go on and, and unleash their, their greatest potential. But it wasn't actually the academic achievement that gave me the goosebumps, but the fact that, that this child um, is, has created like the most unbelievable ripples already in the world just by the way that she lives her life. Um, and one, one moment that comes back to me as we speak um, that, that I think is illustrative of this is at, at one point in, in the journey, we took our children um, to a home um, for elderly people in Mumbai, but also people um, who had lots and lots of, of, of physical deformities. And it was very difficult for young children to go into the home and see that. Um, and we decided to do an experiment with our kids. And we said for the next hour and a half, just go and find anybody in the home and just talk to them. And we said, no questions, just go and do this. And I remember um, Priyanka went to a lady um, and, and started talking to her with a lot of um, arm yeah. gestures and movements. And a couple of minutes later, I walked past and I realized that both of them didn't speak the same language. Like they had no language in common. And I said, this is going to be fascinating. Like how long is she going to sit there and actually be able uh, to speak to this lady? But one and a half hours, they sat together and smiled. And at the end of it, there were hugs. Anyway, fast forward, we left the place and went back three months later. And when we went back, Priyanka had taken a bar of chocolate for this uh, lady because she was fondly remembering her. But Priyanka also had with her on that day a teddy bear that had been really sort of a, a, a very important teddy bear to her, which represented a real security to her. Um, and so when she went to this old lady, she had the chocolate bar in one hand and she had the teddy bear under her arm. And I think the old lady mistakenly thought that she had brought the teddy bear for her as well. And so in that moment, Priyanka had to decide, do I give her just the chocolate bar or do I give her this teddy bear, which to me represents so much. And, and she hesitated for a moment and then she gave her the teddy bear. And that evening I spoke to her and I said, Priyanka, I said, you look a little bit troubled. And she said, yes, Didi. And I said, why? I said, such a beautiful thing you did, you know? And she said, no, Didi. She said, if I really understood compassion, I would not have hesitated for that moment. Wow. Um, and she was 14 at the time. Um, and so, you know, you can sort of play the story out, but I think when children grow up wrestling with and, and practicing the values that matter to them, there is just a very powerful ripple effect in the world. Beautiful, beautiful, all right. Yeah, I think for a 14 year old uh, to have that sense uh, or that sense of connect, uh, I think it's, it's, it's hard to say how much of it is natural, gifted, and yeah, but it's just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I found that like, it's actually, I mean, the experiences that we surround our children with and the role models that they have in their lives, like children naturally want to do good and to be good. They, uh -huh. they, they get so much excitement out of out of doing good and being good and that's been one thing we've just observed again and again um at teach for india no, no absolutely i absolutely agree uh, at the same time there is there is also a deep sense of attachment for children to their toys and yeah to those pieces right and being able to give that away uh, i think is phenomenal yeah absolutely like i struggle with my kids if they have to share their toy uh, yeah. with someone else. So being able to give that away and for good uh, yeah. is like a phenomenal uh, move. All right, so I, I'm going to 
move to one of my personally favorite themes uh and it is the theme of serendipity right while while we all plan our lives uh in a certain manner and this is or whether it is short term medium term long term uh there is uh the part where life has its own plans for us right in, in some of the pieces uh what kind of a role has serendipity played uh, in your life in your journey so far uh, both on the external front on your in the on the work front and in terms of your inner transformation itself yeah so you know uh, my colleagues will uh, will share if you ask them that i'm not a very good planner um i i think you know more than more than serendipity i, I think for me instinct has been a really big driver of of many of the the decisions i've taken some of them have turned out good some of them have turned out not so not so well um but i i can really sort of attribute a lot of the different directions that my life has taken to a sudden i don't know maybe there is internal serendipity i don't know but like a a sudden um instinct that is is telling me like go this way even if like logically it doesn't make too much sense um and so that that i feel is a pattern i i do feel between my head heart and and hand my my heart um usually is the driver of 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 how i take decisions and how i live my life so so that's one um challenge of course i think has been a, another thing that comes to mind as as you say serendipity i think it's been a driver of of many changes um in my life as well um and then it just i i i don't know i mean we think a lot and we talk a lot about flow um and i think you start as you get older becoming just a little bit more aware of actually how little you can control like even if you want to control it and i i do think um as a younger person i i had a very high need to control still like my instinct is um to want to do things really well to like want to know what the outcome is and 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 i know that that's been a very interesting conversation with many people in in the manav sadhana ecosystem as well that like is it about the journey is it about the outcome and i think i've shifted a little bit um towards the journey side um but but not fully for sure i i think i'm still very rooted in like a, a direction um but then understanding that the direction's not going to be like a straight path it's going to go up and down and a lot of that is is outside of your control fabulous interesting to hear that uh all right i'm going to switch to uh i think we are all in the middle of one of the largest disasters uh, we have seen over the many decades uh, i'm going to switch to talking about the pandemic and impact the impact it has had um, and it is still having uh, on the educational ecosystem um, in the meanwhile just want to quickly remind our viewers uh, please send in your questions uh, either through the chat uh, or through ask at service space dot org. That's the email ID you can use to send in your questions. Uh, otherwise, you can post them on the chat. Um, all right. Uh, yeah. So uh, over the last year or so, uh, I think we are aware we have witnessed some unprecedented changes uh, in education and learning, uh, Shahid. And. Uh, wanted to understand how have you as an educator and as someone running various impact initiatives processed all of this like what did it take for you to uh, because the way the pandemic hit uh, and what life was before and life became after uh, there was a significant shift right and especially for you running tfi and akanksha uh, how did you process all of this yeah So, so Krishna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell upon the the many challenges. I think the audience is is aware, and of course, like this this year has been um, 
an even bigger bigger eye opener on the difference that a, a, a skew of opportunities means for children. Um, undoubtedly, I think the pandemic has hit all children, but it hit my children at home very differently than it hit my Teach for India children. And so um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell upon that. I, I do think, like for me, there were several moments in the year where honestly, I just felt a little bit stupid that I hadn't seen very obvious opportunities um, in education that the pandemic suddenly made very clear. Um, and, and a couple of these, one, one actually, one of my, my students pointed out on a call somewhere in the middle of the, the year, um, she suddenly said, Didi, she said, you know, I realized just now that like learning doesn't happen in a classroom. And, and that was one of my, my biggest learning this year, right? That like, I mean, it's such a beautiful uh, 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 title for this talk that you all chose, The School of Life. But that was one of my, my big learnings that like you learn everywhere. And when I look back at my own life, I can point to a very small amount of learning that happened in a classroom and a huge amount of learning that happened from life, right? So, so the opportunity there to say, how can learning stop when literally just the four walls of a classroom close down, right? There's something wrong in our system and our world when that happens. So that was, that was one, one big moment. The second moment, equally like, again, obvious and stupid in retrospect was um, like, why does learning only happen to have, uh, why, why does learning only need to happen with the teacher who happens to be at the front of your classroom, right? So if you're lucky and you have a transformational teacher, you're lucky. And if you have a terrible teacher, you're unlucky. But like you're basically, your life is determined by the human being in front of the classroom. Um, and suddenly the pandemic sort of challenged that, right? And it said, no, actually your teacher can be anybody. And, and, and your teacher can be sitting on the other side of the world and your teacher can be a student who is five years younger than you and like, you know, anybody can teach and anybody can learn. Um, and by the way, like learning doesn't just happen from teachers, it happens at home from parents and from your community and from the life that you live every single day. And so that was, I think, you know, the, the, the beautiful African concept of Ubuntu came alive for me very much this year that like, yes, it takes a village not just to raise a child, but it takes a, a village to educate a child as well. Um, so those were, were two big opportunities. I, and I think that um, the enabler that technology can be, despite you know, all the research, which is really mixed right now on whether like, we can roll out technology at scale, whether it will make a difference, but, but, but the enabler that it can be um, was a very powerful opportunity, right? The idea that, you know, maybe there are things that are better done in person in a classroom, and maybe there are things that are better done um, using technology. And if we can really find the right blended approach, maybe all children can have the opportunities that they need and opportunities don't get that skewed. Um, so that's really what we uh, at Teach for India, we've been thinking very, very deeply about that let's not like, you know, run around and try and find like apps on smartphones as a band-aid solution, but let's really step back and thoughtfully um, reimagine what a blended approach could look like even when schools reopen. Um, and, and how can a blended approach allow us to move from teaching a classroom of children to teaching individuals because we, we all know that like each one of us has such different needs. Um, so those were, were some of the, the big learnings. And then the second learning, slightly different, but won't be surprising um, to you at all. And, and perhaps my, my most powerful learning, and again, a very obvious one, you know, for years I've been thinking about collective action and community and the power of community and ha have always believed in it um, intellectually. I think this year I really felt it in my heart in a way in which I've never felt it before. Like 
Mm -hmm. I have never been as proud of our extended community um, as I have this year. It's been just phenomenal. I think everybody listening to this will have their own version of this, but to see people's vulnerability in being able to reach out for help and to see people sort of jumping in to help um, you know, again, Nippon in, in, in a conversation uh, years ago, a lot of these concepts came to me as intellectual concepts, what, what a gift economy is. Yeah. Um, but I think this year, like we saw a gift economy, right? We saw when people were stronger, they were reaching out and supporting. And when people were weaker and needed help, they were reaching out to receive. And so the way that giving and receiving has spread in the world and the power of community. I think a lot about that. And I think a lot about that for our children that, you know, we, we leave our kids with math and science and, you know, uh, some amount of good values, but do we actually think in our goals that we need to leave our kids more than with anything else with a strong community of people around them? that will help them navigate the ups and downs of their lives and always be there. And, you know, my mind goes to a, a very dear friend of mine who was an Akanksha teacher in early days um, called Anjali. And, you know, her children, I mean, they've been out of school 15 years now, are still on a WhatsApp group and reaching out to each other um, for help and to, to share achievements. And, you know, that community is still alive or all those years later. And I think that's one of the most powerful things we can give our children. Wow, wow, okay. I think at the end of this short piece, there are at least three things that are staying uh, on my mind. One, one is the, the aha moment that you mentioned uh, around the kid speaking to you and saying, oh, learning doesn't happen in the classroom. Uh, it happens outside. That's, that was a real aha moment. I think the second is the last part that you mentioned around we should, how it's important to leave children with a community around them, right? Which, which they can connect with uh, closely. Uh, the third is in fact a, a comment and a question, maybe a follow-up question as well, uh, Shaheen. Uh, it was interesting how you brought up uh, the topic of uh, technology and the blended approach uh, with technology. Right, which we might have to take going forward. Uh, how much of a mindset shift uh, is needed or has been needed uh, for that over the last one or two years? Or do you think the pandemic has made it easier to create that mindset shift? Yeah. Also, uh, I've also seen a joke floating around, uh, which I think is true in many organizations that uh, the coronavirus is the new CTO or the CIO of your company. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the pandemic has definitely helped, I think, for sure. It's, I think, given an impetus to that, that shift. I think it's going to be an uphill, long journey, Krishnan, but I think it's one we need to get on really soon. Um, there are massive issues with just procuring hardware, with retraining teachers. Um, I think kids pick up technology very quickly. I think it's more the barriers around them, right? Like parental investment, upskilling teachers, rethinking our school schedules and timetables to enable technology. Um, and of course, just, just the cost and logistical nightmare of rolling out um, technology to, to 320 million kids. So, so I think it's going to be um, a long journey and I think it's going to require many, many mindset shifts and, and not just mindset shifts. I think a lot of reskilling um, to be able to do it. But, you know, I've never seen inequity as deeply as I did this year with children where high income kids, my own included, like literally migrated overnight to virtual learning to the extent that I've heard so many high income kids this year sort of question even the need to go to school because they're so plugged in now with world-class learning um, that like the, the digital space for them is as important, it's gonna over time become more important than even the textbook, right? 
And so if we're not thinking about digital access and a blended approach for our most vulnerable kids, the gap is just going to get wider and wider and wider. Like I don't think hardware and technology, even three, five years from now, is just going to be as important as learning to read and write. Um, mm. so, so, so while, yes, I've seen the difficulty, like even in a small organization like Teach for India, Um, even in a small organization like, like Teach for India, Krishna, and I've seen um, the uphill task of raising money for hardware, reskilling teachers, all of these aspects, it's not easy to do. And at the scale of governments, it's going to be really tough. But I think we need to start thinking, planning. We need to embrace that new reality going forward. Got it. Uh, yeah, I, I am sensing some network issues. I'm not sure if it's at your end or my end. Uh, are you able to hear me, Shaheen? I am. Yeah, you froze for a minute, but I can hear okay. you well now. Got it. All right. Uh, so what do you see coming out of all of this, right? Are there, uh, and, and maybe I will, uh, talk about this more in a cultural sense, right? Uh, do you see a cultural shift happening uh, in, edu in how education and learning uh, happens going forward or people's approach uh, towards education and learning going forward? Uh, is that here to stay? Is this a temporary or how much of this is temporary and how much of this uh, could be a longer term shift? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> whether it's here to stay is like in each one of our, our hands to decide. Um, I think it needs to stay. I think some of these changes need to stay. <clears throat> but I think we need to like jump on board. Um, and change is difficult. Um, and it's very, very difficult in a, in a country like India with, with our diversity and our scale. Um, but, but my submission would be like, let's jump on board and let's figure it out together. I think we figured out a lot together over this last year. I've seen um, collaboration happen across organizations in ways that feel really beautiful and really important. Um, and I think if we do come together and put our strengths together, we can sort of embrace this new reality and plan well for it. You know, I, I, I'm not espousing like tomorrow Mumbai government go out and like buy hardware and, and like distribute it to all children. Um, I think we need to get to that place, but we need to do it thoughtfully and we need to prepare people well. And I think the other aspect of culture that needs to be, I think, a, a new reality is just parental involvement um, and student involvement in their own education. I think I've seen beautiful evidence of that this year, right? Where I guess, especially with younger children, parents were the primary teacher. And while like, yes, that, that needs to lessen over time and the school needs to come back for sure. How do we not lose the beauty of that? Um, we've seen students reaching out and teaching each other the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, involving students in the whole process of their own education and the education of others. How do we hold that going forward as well? Got it. I, I'm, I'm going to do one more question, Shaheen, and then maybe we sh uh, we'll look at uh, questions coming in from the audience, from, uh, from viewers across. Uh, and uh, this one is uh, really more in terms of, uh, so if we look at children going to school in India today, uh, we know that more than half of them go to government schools. Right. And we also know the kind of impact uh, these children have had over the last one year or so. It's, uh, it's almost like losing a year of education in school, uh, or at least school-based education. Uh, do you see long-term implications of this uh, for, for these kids uh, and for the country? Uh, or what is the extent of damage uh, in your 
individual perspective uh, b- because of this yeah i mean my my perspective is that we have no idea of how damaging this year has been on children um and we need to do whatever we can with minimum risk um to get kids back um to some kind of physical interaction like i'm a a big believer that kids go to school for many reasons content and academics is one um but it's not the the only driver of why we go to school and i think the kind of anxiety kids are facing today um from a lack of socialization a lack of a space to actually be with others um is 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 a huge like damaging um uh, aspect to all of this as well um and so my my very strong opinion is we need to again as civil society work very closely with governments um and and follow medical advice and medical research and open schools um safely not in the way that they used to be um but even like one touch point a week for kids is going to make a huge difference going forward i don't think we can afford um to keep schools closed for the next couple of years um and i think there are ways to do it you know bring in small groups 25% attendance in schools um but i i think we need to really uh, put a put our heads to that got it got it yeah and uh yeah I, it is a difficult situation to be in and i can uh, i do resonate with you when you say that it is hard for us to imagine what's the extent of damage uh done uh yeah at best what we can do is do what you can to get it back uh but get in get it back to the earlier shape it was in and and i think there are a bunch of people trying to make efforts uh in in that in that area uh even if it is tech enabled uh or because it's very hard to get them to the classroom in the current scenario and there are external factors influencing it uh it will be interesting to see how best we can deal with this situation and get them back into the normal routine that is going to be a one of the toughest challenges i i also uh, do think uh, for the government school kids especially all right so uh, i will hand it over to nisha in a minute before that i am going to cheat a little bit and uh for my own curiosity shaheen ask you a couple of quick things uh tell us about uh, shahin the parent <laughs> shahin the parent like uh, this is a question you should be addressing to my my kids um directly but I, i think for me um i've always felt very like pulled in in multiple directions and like i've never got it fully right i think for many years when i was at work i was worried about my kids and when i was at home i was worried about work and there was a lot of guilt associated with that for a, a large part of my career i think one day i just shed the guilt saying like it's not a helpful emotion it's not helping my kids it's not helping my work and and i think what led to that actually one of my biggest role models is my very dear friend anu um who was also the the chair of our board for many years and i remember her, she she had many stern conversations with me that have been life changing but a one particular one she sat down and looked straight at me and she said do you think you're a superwoman and it it really shook me you know because actually i sort of thought that i was trying to be a superwoman in my life and and I, and and she said like never try to be a superwoman you know she's like all of us have two sides to us we have the ordinary and we have the extraordinary and when we're too ordinary we need to seek the extraordinary and when we're too we feel we're too extraordinary we need to pull ourselves right back down to the ground and remember that we're ordinary and i think letting go of that idea that i need to be a perfect mom helped me actually counterintuitively become a better a better mom um i think where i hopefully uh have been a good parent is in the example of how i've lived my own life um i think where i could have been a much better parent is in the time um that i spent with my kids growing up 
I felt a lot of a lot of uh, drive to serve children who I felt had less than my own children. And I think I compromised many moments where my kids probably needed me um, growing up. Yeah. Beautiful, all right. Uh, all right, we are at 10.58. I am going to quickly hand it over to Nisha uh, to take some, take on some of the audience uh, questions. Uh, thank you, Shaheen. It was fabulous uh, having this conversation with you so far. And let's see if we get a few minutes in the end, I will come back to you. Sure. Uh, Nisha, over to you. Thank you, Krishnan. Um, thank you, Shaheen. It was uh, quite illuminating for me as a mother and a homeschooling parent, um, and also um, got some ideas for our homeschooling community. And um, we would like to uh, start off the audience uh, questions with a blessing uh, from none other than Jayesh Bhai, uh, who's the founder of ESIN Manav Sadhana and also one of the mentors for Shaheen. Um, he says, deep love for Shaheen and I bow down to her spirit of service and kind, compassionate soul. Grateful for our connection. Um, so that's from Jayesh Bhai. And um, Shaheen, um, maybe I will start off with a question of my own. Um, and uh, in one of your interviews, you had talked about um, looking at an issue or a problem by holding a mirror instead of a magnifying lens. Um, can you show, uh, can you like tell us more about that? Sure. Um, that actually, you know, we had, uh, we had some trainers many years ago um, come to us from the KIPP schools in the US and, and they had introduced this concept, but um, I thought it was a very beautiful concept. And, and basically the, the idea is that when a challenge hits you, you always have a choice. You can pick up a magnifying glass, which is what usually our tendency is. And when you pick up a magnifying glass, you see the problems as outside you. Um, and you tend to externalize. And, and very often those are, are real, those are real challenges and, and real reasons. But you also have a choice to pick up a mirror. Uh, a, a mirror. And when you pick up a mirror, you look at yourself. Um, and when you look at yourself, you start asking like, what can I do about it? Like irrespective of whether I cause the challenge or problem or not, really the only thing I have control over is myself and what I can do about it. Um, and so we've often used this with, with teachers, you know, when a, a teacher, young teacher has a very bad day um, in class and they come back and there are a hundred reasons they come up with, um, which are, are again valid, right? Maybe the parents aren't that invested. Maybe the kid wasn't paying attention. Maybe like, you know, the school environment wasn't strong enough. Um, but, but we say like, if you pick up the mirror and you ask yourself, what can I do about it? You'll go back a little bit more empowered tomorrow and maybe things will start to shift. Thank you, thank you. And um, there is this question from Satish. He says, um, we are students of life. When can I say I have graduated? <laughs> I mean, my, my, that's a beautiful question. I, I think my instinctive reaction to that is never, you never graduate from, from the school of life. And um, I think, like, again, again, Anu is coming back to my mind now. Um, at her age, um, she is such an active, like, and curious student of life. And uh, that's such a powerful powerful reminder to me that like we just keep learning and changing and if you can keep that curiosity and more than even curiosity if you can keep that sense of wonder alive um and uh, you know just wonder at the world and understanding it and wonder at understanding yourself um i think you you always then stay in the school of life Maybe it's better to stay in the school of life than to graduate. <laughs> and um, a question from Vipul. 
Uh, dear Shaheen Bibi, you've inspired thousands of us to work with children and engage with the education field. So much gratitude for that. My question, if and how has your vision of excellent education and approach towards transformative teaching learning evolved over the years? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think as a teacher, um, when I was much, much younger, at, at 18, when I started teaching, I think a lot of my instincts on what education really is and the purpose of it are not that different from where I am today. But I think along the way, I sort of lost the way a little bit. I think I got, got a little bit caught up in, well, it is about like academic rigor, which I, I do believe is a part of it. But I think some of those initial concepts that I knew to be so important when I was a teacher, I said, education has to be fun. Like kids have to love learning. Um, that, that you have to build like 20 different methods into your lessons so that you reach every last learner. Um, that like education doesn't just happen in the classroom. But I remember as a teacher, I used to pick up my children from the community every day. And we used to like, read like the hoardings on the way to school to practice reading and we used to sing songs in the bus to start our class and so I think a lot of that is 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 true today I think I'm able to articulate a little bit more clearly um, what I believe the purpose of education is today and and I think um, this is of course will will continue to evolve but if you ask me today I think education is, is about self, it's about other, and it's about country and world. And, and, and in the self bucket, it's really about discovering who you are, um, discovering what your greatest purpose is, um, discovering and building the skills to, to live the kind of life that you want. So that, that for me is the self piece. Um, and I think in India, you know, we have a narrow understanding of self in most of our schools, which is really like education is about a job. So expanding the self bucket. I think education is also about the other. It's not just about like, it's not just about me and the life I want to lead, but what am I doing to provide opportunities to those around me so that they can lead the lives that they want to lead so that their, um, their potential is, is fully unleashed. Um, and so other is about the way I am with others in the world, but it goes beyond that. It's also about like the opportunities I create for others to unleash their potential. And finally, the India and world bucket is about like, you know, can education be really the, the, the playing ground to understand what I want to shift, small or big, and to practice what it means to shift it. Um, so that I'm committed to leaving my country, my world, a little bit closer to my own dream of where I want it to be. Um, and I think, you know, if kids came to school every day, thinking like, that, that's why I come to school. Like I remember teaching a class once, I think it was a grade five class, and I, I did a session on the purpose of education. And I remember their eyes lighting up when I said like, what if you came to school every day thinking, I come to school not to like do well on my math test, but I come to school to make my country and my world better. Like, you know, and, and the kids got so excited by that, that concept. So I think the balance of self, other, India um, is, is really important in, in the definition of education. Wow. Um it really spans the intellectual, emotional, and social dimensions um, and with a very strong be the change lens for the child. Um, it's amazing how you inculcate these at such a young age. Um, yeah, I think the next question is also uh, connected to that. Um, it is from, um, yeah, Ankita. Ankita runs the Fountainhead School in Surat, and she asks, how do you imbibe the value of personal transformation 
among TFI fellows and your team? You know, again, I'll go back to, I think children are our greatest teachers in personal transformation. Like I realized very, very early on that you can't teach kids to be respectful and then shout at your kids, right? Like they are every minute watching what you do, what you don't do, what you say, what you don't say. Um, and, and I think that's one of the, the hardest things about being a teacher is it, it is a journey of becoming a better human being and your kids are there on that journey with you. Um, so I think really just helping teachers see that, see and, and deeply understand the importance of being a teacher, right? I, I, I often tell fellows that like, in what other job do you leave a legacy in the minds and hearts and souls of people, right? That's what you do when you're a teacher. Um, and it's such a profound legacy you leave. Um, so, so I think what helps our fellows is one, like reorienting and, and, and understanding education to be something much broader, much more profound than they potentially thought it was. Um, and to understand their role as being just very, very important and transformational and not um, a role where you have to be a perfect teacher, but a role where you're on the journey of learning with your children, right? And when you make a mistake, you can stand up in front of your class and say, sorry, I messed up. And your kids will, will accept that. So, so I think that, that that helps. I think the other thing that, that helps is really creating safe spaces for teachers to talk and be vulnerable. Um, so activities, we do activities like life maps where um, circles of trust, people just talk. They're able to talk about things that they've done well. They're able to talk about things they're ashamed of. They're able to talk about their greatest challenges. Can you create spaces for, for teachers that feel very, very safe? And I think when you're able to do that, they are then able to do that in classrooms with children. And it, I, to me, I think it's one of the biggest things that is needed in the world today. Um, space is not just where I can be safe, but where I can create a safe space for someone else, um, not just to voice what's on their mind, but to be who they really are. Um, and the, it feels like there are too many walls we've put up in the world today between us. Can we break those down just by dialogue and by understanding? And if I might, I'll just share one thing that came to mind right now. One of our um, fellows started a very beautiful concept called the Guftagu Circle. Mm -hmm. And what he did was he just brought together very unlikely people every two weeks in a school. And I, I was in one of these circles where there was a second standard student. The lady who swept the floors of the school was there, the principal of the school, the local corporator. So very motley group of people. And all that happened in that circle was people shared aspects of their life story with each other. And there was no response. There was no question answer. There was just listening to each other. And I remember after the lady who swept the floors of the school, she shared and, and she shared that, you know, I've been offered by three or four other schools a higher salary, but I will never leave this school because in this school, everybody looks me in the eye and knows my name. Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing the principal of the school's eyes tear up because I think she never understood how important that, that act was. Um, and so I think that's an example, Nisha, of just like, can we find very simple spaces, circles to really listen to each other um, as far as possible without judgment and with acceptance? It's beautiful, Shaheen. Um, it, I'm a little moist in my eyes because it reminds me of my dad. Um, and uh, he was a teacher and a principal. And uh, he used to um, have circles after school. After school, when all the teachers would rush out home because they have to pedal their cycles and go maybe you know 10 kilometers, as it was in those days. And my dad had to do that too. But he would just sit with all the vulnerable kids for an hour. And um, yeah, 
and uh, he was also offered teaching positions at many schools but he chose to work at a school which was closest to um few slums in my hometown to see so um yeah i totally resonate with the safe space um and i think we'll take a couple of more questions um maybe yeah one question is from nithya shriram from singapore with the pandemic moving a lot of education online would this create space for volunteers outside india to help yeah i mean i i think the answer is yes i think we've seen um beautiful examples of people reaching out from all over the world um and and again i think the the issue behind that for low income children is the issue of hardware how do we provide um access stable internet those have been some of our, our biggest challenges but i think if we're able to make progress on that dimension um and able to really find ways to connect people that want to help with uh the needs then that is certainly i think possible yeah thank you and the next question is from uh shivani sha a fellow of park uh, hot 2021 what is the one most important thing we this year's fellows need to keep in mind when we are still struggling with this pandemic yeah i mean that's such a beautiful question i i think there's no there's no one one thing for sure i think that's the um that's my immediate immediate thought i think really holding the question what does um what does my leadership need to be to meet the needs of children today um i think teachers over the next year are going to play a role unlike any other any other year that i have known it's going to be the most significant um year to be a teacher because children are going to have so many needs that are new they're going to come back there's going to be fear there's going to be anxiety there's going to be learning gaps and i would say my advice if anything would be really take the lead of your kids listen to them ask them what they need um and then mobilize a community of people to really help um meet those needs and and never underestimate how your kids will be able to help each other um i think we've seen that in in beautiful ways so again the the service based ecosystem introduced me many years ago to the concept of many to many um and i i can still visualize the first time i saw it all these dots with lines connected everywhere um think of your classroom i would say shivani as as dots with lines connected everywhere it's not all the lines connected to you standing in front of the class but you really enabling people to connect uh lines to each other and help each other and again same thing is create safe spaces let kids talk about what they need um and really openly ask for help along the way um to meet the needs of your kids thank you shivani um we'll take one more question from vishal he says uh, while technology has made education more accessible it has also bombarded children with a lot of information leading to reduced attention span and indecisiveness when it comes to choosing a path for their lives how do we inspire such confused children to navigate their way around so much information yeah uh, it's such a good question um i don't know i'm such a a believer that we just need to like reduce screen time and not have our kids just only be on their screens but go back to the things that we know was so important and formative for children just play and spending time together and being able to look at another human being and talk to them directly and not like text them um i think one is that just the balance of like what are the different things that children do in their lives with technology being really important but not being the only the only piece and i think the second is at least um what has helped me a lot has been just finding they've, they've been different practices at different times in my life but finding the practices that help you process you know i think if you're constantly just absorbing information you don't have the time and space to 
actually makes sense of, but what's my own opinion? Um, how, how is this impacting me? Like, I think we often tell our kids and when I, I used to teach, I used to always tell kids like the experience you have really matters much less than what you take from that experience, right? I can sit through a very boring lecture and learn more life lessons from that boring lecture than from the best professor. If my orientation is to make sense um, of, of how I'm experiencing my life. So I think teaching kids how to reflect, how to make sense of things, how to step back, um, how to choose what they look at, like these are the skills that I think are gonna become very important. Yeah. Thank you so much um, for bringing awareness into awareness. And uh, there is um, probably one question from Rohit that seems to be in sync with what you're talking about. In times of emergency like this, we tend to prioritize the immediate short-term fixes, like children are not being able to attend school, so let's start online classes. Then before we know, there's the next emergency demanding our immediate attention again. So it's the classic challenge that long-term important work, which is subtler, often gets sidelined. What are some of the longer term aspects that you're seeing which we should be paying attention to during this pandemic from the lens of education? Yeah, such a good question. And I, I can resonate a lot with that tension. There's almost a sense of guilt in focusing on anything longer term when the immediate seems so urgent right now, right? Like, can I help connect somebody who might be able to get a hospital bed or an oxygen cylinder, or there's just an overwhelming number of immediate pieces. Um, I think the first thing is just like overcoming that guilt and creating space in your own day to step back and to be focused on, on the future. And that itself is, is not the easiest thing to do. Um, but I think it's so important because I think if we don't do it, we will um, you know, push back additional crises and challenges that will unfold in the future just because we haven't had the time and space to prepare for them. Um, what are those things? I think, again, it's conceptualizing, like, what is this new form of education? Like, you know, so to go back to just some of the things I said, like, are we expanding how we think about the purpose of education? If we're doing that, then what is a blended approach to get there? thinking through what is best done online, what is best done in person, thinking about who are the people that I can leverage to be the new teachers in this world. And then of course, thinking about what is it going to take to prepare um, my team, my people, my country for this new reality. So I think it's a little bit of like, starting with really deeply grounding ourselves in the why, like a commitment that we will not go back um, to how it was. We will use this as an opportunity to reimagine. We'll hold on to that. Even when schools reopen, life starts to open up as it inevitably will. Um, the second part, once we're grounded in the why, is really the what. So what is that model of blended learning? And then I think spending a lot of time on the how. Um, how are we going to upskill ourselves, each other, mindsets, skills to be able to embrace this new, this new reality? Thank you, Shagin. And uh, it may be of interest uh, for you and the viewers to know that on uh, 30th May, Awakened Talks will host another educator, Naveen Amarasuriya and he runs the Contentment Foundation of Singapore. So uh, we may get to hear more about the subtle values there as well. Um, and uh, thank you so much for spending time with us. And I will be handing over to Rohit, who has a surprise in store for us. But before <laughs> I would like to take this opportunity to thank every viewer and also our Awakening Talks Rockstar volunteer team. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Shaheen, Nisha, and Krishnan. This was such a beautiful conversation. So many gems to pick on, so many interesting questions. And, and I think uh, 
certain points of view which I feel a need to sort of go back and think more. I really, you know, just if I were to offer one, I really loved the point which you said, which was, I think, so amazing for me, which uh, you said that uh, it's not the actual experience, but how you are oriented in that experience and how you uh, reflect and how you basically whatever. So it's, it's I think, on a broader level, I, I see it as like you can't control the circumstances of the light, but how you process that inwardly, it's like how you respond to that stimulus is what it makes all the difference. And I think Victor Frankl said, and that's where we are, our freedom lies. So thank you so much, Shaheen for all the beautiful work which you are doing. Uh, so now there's like, as Nisha said, there's time for like a small surprise, which uh, actually not me, but uh, some of our youngest volunteers have <laughs> put together for you. They have done a fantastic job, but we were sort of a bit uh, tardy at the end trying to put it together. So we'll just you know, <laughs> roll with it. And uh, I think uh, you will figure out, but just for our audience, it's actually, you know, we, Shaheen, we have been very inspired by all your like multifaceted skills. And one of it includes like a heart of poetry. And, and <laughs> we saw one of your poems, which was like so beautiful and it resonated with so many of us, which was called Get, Get and Give. So it's like few of our young volunteers actually sort of, creating a rap song out of that so so here it is uh, and we'll, i'll just put it up on screen in a moment thank you the poem is about two characters one is called get and one is called give. So this is what get says to give and what give taught get. Get said to give. In order to live, just take what you can. Be rich, dearest man. Learn to grab and to claw. Always want more, more, more. And don't stop to think what you are wanting for. Be rich, man. Be cool. Send your kid to a school where he will grow up to be a rich get just like me. Then give interrupted get stop get please stop. I'll stop with the speaking after the top. Make me giddy, I'm dizzy, I'm busy, I'm sick. You're up to no good, yes, I know all your tricks. You're making these people think love can be bought, that happy mistake is money abroad. I know your type, get. I used to be you too. I stumbled on giving and what it can do. And that is what I must share here with you. I used to feel good, get. Just giving away some old clothes. The toy ones, the jeans that were frayed. Then one day, a child said that he dreamed he could play with a new toy. A new toy, now I give away. So I went out and bought and a shirt that was cool Thinking about what he wear after school And the top car I bought him up shiny bright blue I thought of what 6 year old boys I could do And the smile that he gave me, yeah, that smile, it was real So real that my heart didn't know how to feel And the next day while walking, I saw a small child She asked for some money, her hair was quite wild And when I said no, she pointed afar To a coconut vendor behind all the cars I followed her zigzag across Mumbai Lab Street. We sat down with coconut and dusty tart seeds. Just me and the little girl sipping away, a sliver of joy had slipped in my day. And as we were chatting about things that she chose, a man not too far watched and then quietly rose. And then came towards us and almost ashamed, gave a bright shiny apple and left as he came. When you see get, you see get. When you start to give, you pay rules for the others to change how they live. When you first start to look, get, it may be a haze, but many are giving, you will be amazed. The tree how it gives off its fruits and its shade. The carpenter gives off the wood that he's made. The teacher she gives every student her right. The puppy he fills every heart with delight. The farmer he gives up his hard earned new crop. The sun he gives us light till the moon says to stop. The temple and mosque really say we are one. The swing takes us high up and down, kind of fun. And music, she gives us a world that is free. And dreams, how they teach us just what we can be. And dreams, how they teach us just what we can be. So I watched get, I watched, and I learned how to give. 
how to always have hope how to love and forgive how to compare myself to feel thank to want less get i learn to share more get i learn to feel blessed get i learn to share more get i learn to feel blessed get i learn to share more get i learn to feel blessed Oh, so beautiful. Thank you. Uh, so Thank you, Shine. <laughs> On behalf of all I, our young ones. <laughs> and maybe we'll just take a few moments of silence and gratitude to close and so that we are able to see and honor all this beautiful acts of generosity which keep our life going and may we have the heart to not just only give our leftover toys but to have the heart big heart to you know even just give our away our new ones which so many of your stories and your life has shown us thank you few moments of silence Thank you everyone thank you and we'll see you in a couple of weeks and continue the conversation thank you all <laughs>